the National Desk, America's News, now. Now on the National Desk, Iowa Advocates. The level of support that we're seeing right now for President Trump is unprecedented. See how volunteers are drumming up support for the former president as the Iowa caucus rapidly approaches. Record broken. The national debt hits a new milestone. A larger portion of national output merely has to go towards paying the interest on this debt that was previously issued. The staggering bill that's going up by the minute. And store closures. The fact check team gives some leading reasons why so many stores shut their doors for good last year. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and we start with the latest election news. Former President Donald Trump has officially asked the Supreme Court to review a ruling that kicked him off the primary ballot in Colorado. The state Supreme Court came under fire for claiming he was disqualified on the untested basis of the 14th Amendment. The Colorado Republican Party had already asked the Supreme Court to overturn the ruling. Then are we using this process to circumvent all the safeguards that we would have if he really were charged with insurrection? He never was. They certainly considered it. He's never been charged with criminal insurrection. And if he had been, we have a burden of proof that they would have to make. Right to compulsory process, right of confrontation, jury trial right. I don't think we want to use this amendment in this case uh, to, to circumvent those safeguards. I think politically it ought to be a non-starter. And I think the Colorado case will be reversed and that'll deal with Maine. It is less than two weeks until the start of the Iowa caucuses, and Iowa's attorney general, who backs Trump, is also working to get Trump back on ballots across the country. The National Desk's Skylar Talal reports on Trump's growing support among Iowa voters. Are you a Trump supporter or supporting somebody else? No, nope, I'm planning on supporting Trump. Well, that's awesome. Me too. As a loyal Trump supporter, Richard Williams has been volunteering for the former president over the last few months, calling more than a thousand GOP voters. I'm hearing a lot of people saying, yes, we support Donald Trump. We plan on going to the caucus and any, you know, and we even ask them if they'd like to get involved in tell them how they, you know, they can do that as well. Byrd says efforts to create a stronger grassroots organization has roped in more than 50,000 Republican voters committing to caucus for Trump, with many of them signing on as caucus captains across the state. Energizing volunteers, Byrd says the Iowa caucuses normally start the presidential nominating process, but she believes Iowa will end things with a blowout. The level of support that we're seeing right now for President Trump is unprecedented. It's higher than any other uh, Republican uh, caucus poll uh, that's ever been done in the state. And so if that holds consistent through caucus night, uh, it's, it's huge, it's historic, and I think that's the end of the Biden administration. Trump recently asking the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn the Colorado High Court's decision, kicking him off the state's 2024 ballot, a case, Byrd says, needs to be taken up quickly. How quickly you would like to see maybe the U.S. Supreme Court take this up, and as a state attorney, um, what you could see the, the result decision be. This this election should be decided by the voters, uh, not by certain officials in certain states. That's wrong, and that's against the democratic process. So uh, we are pushing to have that case taken up as soon as possible by the U.S. Supreme Court so that it can be resolved. In Urbandale, Skyler to Law reporting. On the Democratic side, the North Carolina Election Board decided President Biden will be the only Democrat on the primary ticket. The state Democratic Party said none of the other candidates were actively fundraising or campaigning in the state. Marianne Williamson's campaign called it an attempt to circumvent democracy. Shifting now from politics to your money. Many cell phone users can't catch a break on their bills. While some service costs have dropped, the taxes have been rising. The Tax Foundation found that Americans pay hundreds of dollars per year in taxes on their wireless family plans. A home with four phones pays about $300 a year in taxes on a family plan. That costs about 100 bucks per month. Another Biden administration energy proposal, critics say, will cost you more in the long run. The Energy Department unveiled regulations targeting residential refrigerators and freezers and proposed standards for commercial fans and blowers. 
The department claims this could help reduce the cost of utility bills, but the rules would take cheaper models off the market. They take effect in 2029. 2023 ended with the national debt hitting a new record of $34 trillion. The national debt, Satra al Nishar reports, Congress must do something to rein in the budget. America's balance sheet is in trouble. The nation's gross debt reaching the dreaded milestone of $34 trillion, according to the Treasury. Of that, roughly $27 trillion is debt held by the public, and about $7 trillion is debt the Treasury owes other government agencies. Interest rates add to the bill. The debt is growing faster than the national economy, and what that means is that a larger portion of national output merely has to go towards paying the interest on this debt that was previously issued. Consequences of debt this high have already been felt. Back in November, top ratings for Moody's put the U.S. on notice about losing its perfect AAA rating, in large part over concerns about the government's ability to manage its debt, dealing a blow to confidence in the U.S. as the world's reserve currency. And the less effort we put into addressing our unsustainable fiscal situation, the more we potentially jeopardize that status. On Capitol Hill, House and Senate leaders are negotiating spending levels for a new federal budget, parts of which come due on January 19th. Congress is only able to govern basically by crisis at this point. Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget President Maya McGinnis says the only way the U.S. can get to the point where debt isn't growing faster than the economy is with tough choices across the board, from revenue to programs like Social Security. That means spending, that means major programs that have trust funds, and that means taxes. And anybody who's saying they can do it without putting all of those on the table isn't leveling with the taxpayers. Last summer, the White House and House Republicans agreed on spending levels for 2024. Whether they stick to those levels seems up in the air. But the longer Congress goes without passing a full budget, the more likely it is that critical government programs will see their budgets automatically cut. It's not clear, though, which ones. On Capitol Hill, I'm Atra Nashar. And with prices rising, more Americans don't aspire to the American dream of owning a home. Right now, 64% of Americans are homeowners. That is well below the number of homeowners in China at 89% and Brazil at 72%. And it comes as a growing number of Gen Zs, which are teens and those in their early 20s, report they no longer view owning a home as a goal. Some Americans, meantime, are getting slammed by credit card debt. A new lending tree survey shows just 51 percent of credit card customers feel they can pay off their December balance. That is an all-time low. The national credit card balance stands at $1 trillion, and average interest rates are the highest in about three decades. 2023 saw many major retailers closing some doors. I'm with Connor from the Fact Tech team. How many stores closed down? Well, Eugene, retailers closed down over 4,600 stores in 2023, which is an increase of 80% from the year before. Bed Bath & Beyond shut down the most, closing 866 location. And then Tuesday morning, CVS, Family Dollar, and David's Bridal were also at the top of the list for the most amount of closures. But I should mention that it's not all bad news. Retailers also opened nearly 5,500 stores in 2023. More opening than closing, so more good news than bad news. But the ones that did close, what was behind those closures? Well, there's several trends that are making it harder for brick and mortar stores, like the growth of online shopping and inflation, which kept some shoppers from buying certain categories of goods like electronics and jewelry, according to a MasterCard report. There were also retailers like Bed Bath & Beyond that had to close stores after filing for bankruptcy, and then other retailers like Target blaming the rise of theft as a reason for closing down some of their locations. So New year, what are we expecting now, 2024? Well, so far, retailers have announced around 600 store closures for 2024, led by CVS and Walgreens. On the other hand, Family Dollar, Dollar General, and Dollar Tree are targeting more than 1,500 new stores between the three of them this year. And Toys R Us is making a comeback with 24 new flagship stores opening in 2024. We can also expect to see more Five Below, Nordstrom Rack, Boot Barn, and Macy's locations. Well, sounds like a multiple times stores opening and closing. Connor, thanks for more of this Faction Team topic, including links to Connor's sources. Scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldust.com. Price is also going up at Chick-fil-A. A new study found prices for their classic chicken sandwich increased by 21% over the past two years. Industry experts say the surge is due to the rising cost of ingredients, packaging, and transportation from inflation. 
Oil prices do remain a little unstable this weekend as investors fear the expanding war in the Middle East could lead to more supply chain disruptions. Global prices spiked nearly 2 percent after reports of more U.S. military interventions in the Red Sea. U.S. forces were successful in sinking three boats of Iran-backed Houthi fighters that were attacking commercial ships. It's not just oil at risk. Since the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea began, the cost of shipping a container from Asia to the U.S. has gone up 13 percent. Supply chain professionals don't want to deal with geopolitical risk and potential of disruptions that are uh, well outside their control. As a result of the attacks, global shipping giant Maersk decided again to pause routes through the Red Sea. Missouri joining a handful of other states in blocking foreign adversaries from buying farmland near military sites. Governor Mike Parson signed the executive order which bans individuals and groups tied to China, Russia and Iran from owning farmland within 10 miles of military facilities. Foreign investors must also now receive approval from the state in order to purchase farmland. Governor Parson saying the order safeguards our military and intelligence assets, prevents security threats to our state and gives Missourians peace of mind. Coming up next here on the National Desk, harmful Bidenomics. Former White House economic advisor Steve Moore discusses President Biden's handling of inflation. Plus, free lunches, the effort to increase access to free meals for students in Oklahoma. Critics say Bidenomics has proven to do more harm than good with more Americans now worse off and voters are fed up. A recent Monmouth University poll shows President Biden's approval rating has fallen to a record low of 34 percent. The National Desk Jan Jeffcoat spoke with former White House economic advisor Steve Moore about the nation's economy and inflation. The majority of Americans, in fact, nearly 70 percent disapprove of how Biden has handled the economy and inflation. Now, the White House continues to blame the pandemic. What's to blame here, Steve? Yeah, not only does the White House blame the pandemic, the White House is now blaming the media, saying they've been too tough on Biden, which is kind of laughable given, you know, that I work for Donald Trump and the, the way the media treated Trump was a lot worse than they treat Biden. But um Look, the economy is certainly better today than it was a year ago. No question about it. There are really signs of improvement. The stock market um, has been on a tear the last three, four months. You're seeing um, still a pretty jo strong jobs market, although it's slowing down a little bit. And most importantly, the inflation rate has come down. But I want to make sure, Jan, if I may, that people understand that the White House misspeaks when they say prices are falling. Prices aren't falling, it's just the rate of increase is falling. So you still see when you go to the grocery store or go to the gas pump or pay your mortgage, prices up 20, 25 percent. Uh, and that is one of the reasons I think Americans are still are feeling so financially stressed and that 70 percent feel like Biden has not got, done a good job. Yeah, and data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows the disparity between real hourly wage gains under yes. Trump versus Biden. I know you talked about this. Real yeah. hourly wages dropped three percent for all employees since Biden took office versus the years prior under Trump when the real hourly wage yeah. increased over three percent. So what economic policies, Steve, make a difference here? Well, I, I think with respect to Trump, the reason the economy did so well and, and by the way, the average family gained about six thousand dollars of income 
uh, annually adjusted for inflation under Trump. Under Biden, that number is a negative 2,000. And I think that's, you're going to hear a lot, Trump is going to be talking about that a lot if it does turn out to be a rematch between Trump and Biden, that, you know, are you better off than you were four years ago? And for the vast majority of workers, the answer to that question is no. I think what accounts for it is, first of all, I mean, Trump did his big tax cut. He deregulated the economy. And of course, we had the pro-American drilling policies, which created a lot of jobs, Jan, for the U.S. and also kept energy prices low. I think Biden's big mistake was that $6 trillion spending spree. I mean, you just put it on the chart. I couldn't believe it, Jan. $34 trillion of debt. That's a $6 trillion addition in just the last three years. That That is a big stain on, on Biden's record. And that also means we have to increase taxes to pay for all that yeah. in some well, capacity. hopefully not, <laughs> but you may be right. Well, this also, speaking of taxes, is largely because of inflation, which is like a flat tax on everybody. It is the great equalizer with prices up more than 17% since Biden took office. Food prices yeah. are up 20%, energy prices up 32%. Yeah. What needs to happen right. for these prices to come down? Well, let me just correct you on one thing where you said this is uh, like a flat tax. It's actually worse than that. It's more like a regressive tax, yeah. Jan, because the yep. people are hurt the most are the lowest income people. Millionaires and billionaires don't care if the price of food goes up by 22 percent. But for people living paycheck to paycheck, that's a big deal. And so uh, this is this is something that Biden's going to have to explain um, why it is the prices soared so much. We did have those supply chain supply chain problems. Remember a year and a half ago as we were coming out of the pandemic, but prices are still rising. The good news is they're not rising as fast. The inflation rate, which was nine percent in 2022, is now looking at we're looking at about three and a half percent, which is an improvement, but it's still an increase each month in the prices you pay at the store. And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. So to come here on the National Desk, deadly discovery, passenger shot as a man is found dead after crawling into an airplane, airplane engine. Plus dry January will tell you the health benefits of going a whole month without alcohol. This is the National Desk, America's News. Now, we have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From Oklahoma pushing to expand access to nutritious school lunches to thieves targeting charities in Washington State. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start at a Utah airport where a man was found dead inside a plane engine. <laughs> surprised that somebody made it that far. Seems like especially surprising to get on the air side of an airport on your own. Passengers flying into Salt Lake International shocked by the news. A man died after crawling into an airplane engine here last night. Delta says the plane was an Airbus A22-100. Big round, what looks almost like a black hole from here. It's, that's an engine. Mark Light spent more than 15 years as a licensed airplane mechanic. Looking at a photo of a similar A-22, he points out how the engines hang close to the ground. All of the people that are out there, the baggage handlers, the, the ground crew, 
are fairly well trained on what what they can do, where they can be, where they can't be, kind of thing. So it's yes, it's a very regulated, restricted area for even the workers. Joe Dorman, CEO of the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy, shared his support for efforts to increase access to nutritional meals and take a bite out of childhood hunger. Those include Senate Bill 1220. It would give free meals to students if their household made below two and a half times the federal poverty level. They need a good night's sleep. They need to have a nutritious meal for breakfast. They need to have a nutritious lunch. A lot of these families can't afford to pay for that. Last year, efforts to expand free lunch access passed in the House, but stalled in the Senate, according to Dorman. He said SB 1220 would make an additional 150,000 students eligible. Anytime anyone's looking at the issues that we face with children in school, such as the, the poor performance, the inability to pay attention, the reading comprehension, all of this can be tracked back to these kids are probably hungry. Stacks of propane tanks used to sit inside this cage, but last week someone made off with all 20 canisters that Ballard Elks Lodge 827 counts on for its community events. It really hurts us too because it takes away from us doing what we do, which is raise money for the community. Now we got to focus on raising money on for the for new propane tanks instead of putting it back into the community. Deanne Evans is the leading knight for the Ballard Elks, which has been hampered by a range of property crimes committed in and around the lodge. And I don't know how they got that heavy thing out, but they did. And uh, we found like one piece at one of the places that chops up that stuff. The Ballard Elks have had to enhance their security measures as a result, investing in better locks and gates and additional cameras to keep an eye on the property. It just takes our attention away from raising money for what we want to give to instead of replacing the needs that we've already bought from the first place. Coming up next year, resolutions realize nine out of 10 people don't accomplish their resolutions. Advice from experts on how to stick to yours. For many, the start of a new year means new goals. National Desk medical reporter Liz Bonus shows us the benefits of a dry January. There are lots of reasons to consider a dry January, which means you go the whole month without alcoholic beverages. But specialists at the Cleveland Clinic that provided this video say one of the best may be simply to drink less or drink less often. They say many of us don't realize how often and how many medical conditions are linked to alcohol. I tell patients all the time, uh, alcohol causes over 200 different uh, medical diseases. It's associated with 200 different medical diseases from, from obviously liver disease to li heart disease to different cancers to mental health issues. One other reason to consider dry January is that it can change your social habits and get you to consider perhaps some other activities that are really good for you. Removing the alcohol from the social setting a lot of folks will come back and tell me that they actually have more meaningful conversations and they do other things than go to the bar with their friends and family. They'll go on walks, they'll go to the gym, they'll go play board games at home. Um, it's a really nice experiment to understand that you don't have to have alcohol to interact with people. Now, one thought on this, it is suggested this is a good option for people who want to cut down, but if you are truly struggling with heavy drinking or alcohol addiction, it's not suggested you go this month alone trying for a dry January. Finding support can make this journey so different and, of course, can make a big difference in long-term success. 
And that was Liz Bonus. Of course, the challenge is keeping those New Year's resolutions for many people. The National Desk, Janae Bowens, has that research that shows very few have success. It seems like everybody's talking about what they want to accomplish in this new year. To reduce my, reduce the amount of my visceral abdominal fat that I have. 60% of my income goes into savings. I want to improve my posture. I feel like I have very poor posture. According to a poll from Forbes Health and one poll, getting in shape is the most popular New Year's resolution for 2024. However, according to The Ohio State University, only 9% of Americans who make resolutions complete them. 23% of people quit their resolution by the end of the first week. 43% quit by the end of January. Okay, I'm going to go to the gym every day, every day for an hour. No, you're not. Lee Richardson, the CEO of the Brain Performance Center, a behavioral health center, says people fail their goals because they create unrealistic expectations. So what I encourage people to do is say, OK, I'm going to go to the gym three times a week and maybe it's an hour, maybe it's 45 minutes. But whatever you want to accomplish, set goals around that. Make sure that they're measurable. Make sure that they're realistic and make sure that, that you can accomplish them. She says it also helps to have an accountability partner. Son, and there's nothing wrong with asking for help. There's nothing wrong with saying, can you check in with me every week to make sure I get this done? That push could be what's needed to accomplish your resolution. In Washington, I'm Janae Bowens. An accountability partner, that's some good advice. Still to come here on the National Desk, a sudden change, a hotel in Portland being turned into a drug treatment center. Find out how neighbors in the area feel about the transformation. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. Cyber kidnapping. Find out how officials say criminals in China forced an exchange student in America to send them money and later isolate himself in the freezing cold. Plot arrest, a possible arson spree of a teenager prevented will have who was on the hit list of targets. And SAFE Act vetoed why a governor is getting backlash for vetoing a bill regarding transgender minors. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and we start in Utah, where a high school student who was reported missing has been found alive. Utah authorities say criminals targeted a 17-year-old Chinese foreign exchange student who was the victim of a cyber kidnapping. Reporter Paul Nelson with our Salt Lake City station has the story. 
Police say the cyber kidnappers are based out of China, and Riverdale Police Chief Casey Warren says they forced the teen to send them thousands of dollars, or they said they would harm his family back in China. Basically, if you don't do exactly what we say, then your parents will be in danger because, you know, he's talking to him not in person, but over the phone, and they're from China. He's believing he's doing these things here in the U.S. to protect his family in China. When the boy's parents started asking about this missing money, Warren says the kidnappers changed their tactics. They told him to leave and isolate himself, and they began targeting the parents directly. In total, police believe the kidnappers took roughly $80,000 from the victim's family. Warren says they were able to track him down to an area near Brigham City by triangulating his old cell phone pings. Warren also says the boy was not prepared for camping in the cold. Inside that tent, very little supplies. He had a sleeping bag, one of those tinfoil heat blankets, a couple cell phones that we believe were used to kind of carry out and monitor this, this uh, cyber kidnapping. One of the first things he wanted to do was contact his family in China to make sure they were okay. Security experts say cyber criminals often get the information they need to extort their victims from social media posts. Granite School District spokesman Ben Horsley says they teach kids not to post anything that criminals could use. Any private information, literally anything beyond your first name, um, have an account that's private. Do not talk to strangers at all. Paul Nelson reporting in Utah that teen was reunited with his family. A possible terror plot may have been stopped with a high schooler in Iowa now facing several charges. The Fremont County Sheriff's Office says 18 year old Kaylin Sorrell created a hit list of students and staff at Sydney High School. She was a fire cadet for the Shenandoah Fire Department and authorities say she plotted to commit acts of arson towards her targets. She faces seven felony counts of threatening terrorism. This is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and authorities nationwide are working to inform Americans about the crisis. Virginia Attorney General Jason Miatis says human trafficking is the second largest criminal enterprise in the world after narcotics trafficking. He, like so many other state attorneys general, are working to educate residents how to better spot victims who are being trafficked. In Michigan, state police troopers will be out in full force along the freeways to crack down and spread awareness about human trafficking in the state. Authorities say workers in the transportation industry are a crucial resource to combat the crisis. The reason that we like to partner with the truck driving community so much is because they are in more places than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have an opportunity to see things and be in places and be places at times that, you know, a lot of the, the general population is just not going to be able to see. And according to the DOJ, more than 20,000 children are forced into sex trafficking every year in the U.S. In Ohio, Republican Governor Mike DeWine is getting some backlash from his own party. The governor vetoed the controversial SAFE Act. The bill would have made it illegal for minors to use puberty blockers or receive gender transition surgeries. The National Desk reporter Kate Seifert reports from Columbus. I cannot sign this bill as it is currently written. And just a few minutes ago, I vetoed the bill. Republican Governor Mike DeWine going against a number of lawmakers in his own party and backers of House Bill 68 who say the legislation would protect children. However, the governor signaling that by signing this bill, he would be doing the opposite of protecting transgender kids. This is a question of life, uh, as far as I'm concerned. As DeWine describes it, if the bill went into law as it was currently written, it would mean the government knows better than families when it comes to the health of their children. Many parents have told me that their child would not have survived, would be dead today, if they had not received the treatment they received from one of Ohio's children's hospitals. Former University of Kentucky swimmer Riley Gaines has spent years defending women's sports and advocating for equality for female athletes. Minutes after DeWine's decision became public, she posted this message on her social media, calling DeWine a spineless coward that needs to be removed from office. Gaines was recently in Ohio testifying in support of House Bill 68. She described her experience competing against transgender swimmer Leah Thomas during a podcast with Ohio Senate President Matt Huffman. The message we're being sent loud and clear is that we don't matter. We as female athletes, we as women, we don't matter. Our privacy, 
doesn't matter. Our safety, doesn't matter. Our equal opportunities, our fairness, our feelings, our dignity, no, that doesn't matter to them. What matters to them is protecting the feelings and the identity of a male. 22 states have either restricted or banned transgender procedures on minors over the past three years. A fight to protect female athletes brewing in the boxing world after USA Boxing announced it will allow biological men to compete against women. Under the new policy, trans boxers can compete in the female category if they meet certain criteria. The Federation claiming the rules will provide fairness and safety for all boxers. Former super featherweight world champion Michaela Mayer slamming the Federation, writing hormone therapy is banned. By default, this should make trans athletes ineligible for competition, period. Doesn't matter how you feel about the situation, fact is it's illegal and completely disrupts the even level playing field that sport works so hard to create. Critics are calling out the World Health Organization for its transgender guidelines. Last month, the WHO said it will focus on hormone treatment for teens who suffer from gender dysphoria. But more than 4,000 people signed a petition asking who decides, arguing the majority on the WHO's gender panel are trans activists and that rushing teens into these treatments will harm them. A boutique hotel in Portland, Oregon will soon house drug addicts and become a treatment center as the drug crisis reaches critical levels across that city. But the national desk, Emily Gersh, found some neighbors blindsided by the plans. Do you feel like you should have been given a heads up here? Maybe. David Dearborn has lived in the Buckman neighborhood for nearly 40 years. He owns 10 properties that he rents out. On Wednesday morning, the city, county, and the state announced plans to transform the nearby Lolo Pass Hotel into a drug treatment facility with over 70 beds. He says it came as a bit of a shock. They need treatment, and so it's sort of a... A double-sided uh, uh, sword. Elected leaders said two days after the building was put up for auction, social services nonprofit Central City Concern submitted a bid worth $17.25 million to buy it. Other neighbors in the area have mixed feelings about it. Initially, it's concerning, like I think of property value and crime, but the uh, people in the facility have to go somewhere. So The same people who are saying, you know, oh, I, oh, I don't want this here. I don't want this in my neighborhood. There's also the same people who are saying, oh, my God, Portland's going down the tubes. It's going down the gutters. And it's like, well, you got to do something. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners plans to vote on allocating funding for the project with a goal of opening the facility in the fall. Consulting giant McKinsey and Company agreed to a $78 million settlement in a case regarding its role in the opioid epidemic. A group of U.S. health insurers and company benefit plans had accused the firm of fueling the epidemic by advising drug manufacturers to craft deceptive marketing campaigns. In exchange for dropping the case, McKinsey and Company will help reimburse third-party payers for some or all of their prescription opioid costs. Florida's Surgeon General is urging health care providers to stop using mRNA vaccines. Dr. Joseph Latipo wrote a letter telling Florida hospitals to stop giving Pfizer and Moderna COVID shots because he says the FDA failed to follow its own testing guidelines. Latipo wrote that DNA fragments in the vaccines could cause healthy cells to transform into cancerous ones. Now to the classroom in Iowa. The attorney general there is planning to fight a recent federal court ruling that will allow sexually explicit books in libraries. The judge appointed by President Biden blocked portions of a state law that would have removed any book depicting sex acts from school libraries and classrooms. The pandemic took a toll on public school enrollment, losing more than a million students between 2019 and 2021. I'm with Connor from the Fact Check team. Which cities had the biggest drop in enrollment? Well, Eugene, metropolitan areas saw the steepest decline comparatively. And a Wall Street Journal study found between fall of 2019 and spring 2021, enrollment fell in nearly 85 of the largest 100 public school districts. Have those numbers bounced back yet? Well, they have stabilized, but they haven't returned to pre-pandemic levels. Public school enrollment is still down over 1 million students. 
and the federal government projects it's going to fall even more by 2031. And I also found that as of fall of 2022, there are an estimated 50,000 students that are still missing from any kind of school, according to an AP analysis. So where did all these students go? According to a study by Stanford and the AP, 21 states and D.C. keep adequate data on non-public schooling options. And of those states, between fall of 2019 and spring 2022, 14% of students that left the public schools enrolled in private schools, while 26% switched to homeschooling. And also the decline in school age population explains about 26% of the public school enrollment loss, and the remaining 34% may be due to absenteeism, unregistered homeschooling, and an increase in families that are skipping kindergarten. Interesting. Connor, thank you. For more on this fact check team topic, including links to Connor's sources, scan the QR code you see there on your screen or visit us online at thenationaldust.com. So to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from the migrant surge to Harvard's president stepping down. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here to share their insights on the stories they've been covering. It's just over a week until the Iowa caucuses and Republican presidential candidates are campaigning hard for the first votes in the 2024 primary season. National correspondent Atra Elnishar, you'll be in Iowa covering the caucus next week. What's the state of play there? Yeah, candidates are, are making their final pitches to voters before they go to caucus on the 15th and crossing as many of those 99 counties as they can, Steve. But look, if you're just paying attention to the polls, uh, it really does look like this is former President Trump's contest to lose here. And it's more about a race for second place. Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, seemed to uh, be holding that position for much of this, this primary here. But uh, former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, is really gaining on him. Uh, but at the same time, neither of them are polling above 20% consistently. Uh, Trump's really got this in the bag, it seems, if, again, you're just looking at polls. Uh, but if, if you don't win Iowa, you don't necessarily walk away empty-handed. The state's caucuses uh, have 40 delegates up for grabs that night, and, and it's not winner-take-all. So they're divided up uh, based on the allocation of, of support you get among caucus goers. But Iowa, as a state, only has 40 delegates. Uh, out of, out of all the delegates across the country for Republicans in this primary. So it's not necessarily about the delegates and, and the prize that they're winning. It's more about momentum. And history has shown us, Steve, that even second place in Iowa can help sustain a candidate for a period of time. So even if Trump is the winner, it doesn't necessarily mean that other candidates are down for the count. Right, and in recent history, it hasn't been a great predictor of who will wind up being the nominee, although 2024 sure. already is shaping up to be a year unlike any other. So we'll see what happens coming out of Iowa. Meanwhile, the surge of migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border continues at a record pace. National correspondent Christine Frizzell, what's, Christine Frizzell, what's the latest? Yeah, Steve, it seems like every day there are new examples of sort of how this crisis has been expanded. So we just learned last week that for the month of December, uh, we saw more migrant encounters at the southern border than any month ever in history, with more than 300,000. This, as we know, has been impacting border states for years. It's now really impacting big cities like New York, Chicago, and Denver. Um, you know, they're asking the federal government for more help. They say they really cannot keep up with the demand of everything from food to medical attention. Uh, you know, the Denver mayor said just a few days ago that he spoke to a migrant who, who filed the paperwork and got his asylum claim and would be waiting six years to talk to an asylum judge. So that puts it in perspective. Another interesting development is this is starting to hit small rural towns as well. Teeny little towns like Whitewater, Wisconsin are having to deal with this and are uh, also asking the Biden administration for more funding. They need more police officers. They need resources to help them in their small public school system. As far as the Biden administration, you know, they're pointing the finger at House 
uh, Republicans who just last week, you know, made an appearance at Eagle Pass, Texas, more than 60 of them along the border. And, and, you know, the White House called this a political stunt. They say, you know, they left town early in December. They're not working on this bipartisan legislation that the Senate is um, and that they're just trying to play politics here. The Biden administration, the Justice Department also suing the state of Texas for their new law, which allows local law enforcement to arrest migrants there. A lot going on. And every day we seem to learn something new about this. Yeah, you mentioned the White House saying they're playing they're playing politics. Well, we are in an election year and it is an issue that voters are saying is one of their top issues. So I'm sure we'll be, be hearing a lot about this from now until November at least. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Harvard's president, Claudine Gay, stepping down after criticism over her response to anti-Semitic protests on campus and separate allegations of plagiarism. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, this isn't the last we'll be hearing about this story either, right? has been in the headlines for months now. She really started to get a lot of attention for Harvard's response after the October 7th attack on Israel and accusations of rising anti-Semitism on campus. But Steve, that's not why she resigned. She resigned from an investigation that was going on prior to October 7th, and that had to do with her academic work. There had been instances of plagiarism and going through her 11 published papers, 50 counts of plagiarism within those papers. So that's ultimately what caused her to step down. But now there's allegations that she had to step down because of racism. That's actually what Claudine Gay said in her resignation statement and in an op-ed in the New York Times. And she has plenty of supporters who say this is a racist attack on her because she's the first black woman to head up Harvard University. But the students at Harvard actually have a different idea. One of the voting members of the school's honor uh, council, they go through all the academic violations, allegations of plagiarism. They said there's a gross double standard here. There's one standard for students and there's one standard for the head of the university, and they just believe that that is not just. Harvard forced 27 students to withdraw because of academic dishonesty, instances like plagiarism, in 2022 alone, and they average about 17 of those withdrawals a year. A dean at Yale weighed in on CNBC, and, and he said that there were some gross allegations or some gross examples of plagiarism here from Claudine Gay, and, and he can't believe she even kept her job at Harvard. But Harvard will keep her. She will remain a professor, even though she stepped down as president. And Steve, this is what's getting a lot of people. She will also still maintain her salary of nearly $900,000. And on the anti-Semitism response that is being investigated by the federal government and by Congress, so uh, plenty more on that front as well. Kayla, Christine, Atra, thank you all, as always, for your hard work. Back to you. Up next here on the National Desk, caught on camera, watch as a mother attacks her child's bus driver and find out what she says sparked the incident. Now, we have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From Seattle hosting the NHL Winter Classics to a California church targeted in an arson attack, we're taking the pulse of America, but we start in Ohio, where an assault on a bus driver was all caught on camera. <laughs> So you purposely, you purposely literally left my kids? You went another route? New video shows the moment a parent physically attacked a Dayton Public Schools bus driver last week. The assault lasts almost two minutes, all while a busload of elementary school-aged children watched. The defendant drove her car next to the bus, entered it, angrily accusing the driver of purposely leaving her son 
back at the house and not picking the son up and taking the son to school. Montgomery County Prosecutor Matt Heck says 29-year-old Martia Franklin was upset her son was left at his bus stop, but further investigation shows he was not there. The buses have a schedule to maintain, and that's what this driver did. I understand that parents can become frustrated with school transportation issues or school things in general, but restoring the violence is never, ever the answer. When police arrived, they discovered a large rock had been thrown through the front window of the church with fire alarms activated. Officers discovered flames coming from the kitchen area of the church, causing the sprinkler system to go off. Police identified the subject as 57-year-old Anthony Chance of Citrus Heights after he confessed to a taxi driver who brought him back to the scene. After having a little bit of dialogue with this guy in the cab, convinced him to turn himself in. So the cab driver returned back to the church. By this time, police were there, the fire department was there, and he turned himself in and was arrested. Chance, who was previously arrested twice for trespassing, is being charged with felony charges of vandalizing a place of worship, burglary, and arson. Further investigation of the incident has led law enforcement to believe Chance turned the kitchen stove on and set a fire to create an explosion. From what I understand, there was a lot of water damage and, and obviously some smoke damage that the church is going to have to resolve. This whole thing is just incredible. A new year, a new look. It might be a once-in-a-lifetime experience for them, like it is for most of us. On what is not a classic winter day in Seattle, the National Hockey League flipped the script. This is amazing for January. It is why Alex Camacho and her daughter Isabel arrived early. My husband got his tickets and we're like, oh my God, we're gonna go. Along with hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of Kraken-clad fans, all to get their shot at seeing history. They definitely put a lot of time and effort into this, so it's, uh, it's really cool. It took years of planning and weeks for the NHL to build out this temporary outdoor hockey pond in the middle of T-Mobile Park and ice tea, so to speak. It's so weird to see this on the baseball, on the baseball field. Visit Seattle claims the event brought in $30 million in tourism revenue, but it is hard to yet calculate the free three-hour international advertisement or the sales of all those vintage Kraken sweaters at more than 150 bucks per pop. We are super fortunate and humbled to have this opportunity to obviously play in uh, an outdoor game. Seattle hockey man, Kraken baby. And still ahead here, copyright expired. Some of Disney's well-known characters have fallen into public domain. Find out which ones after the break. After nearly a century, Mickey Mouse has finally slipped out of Disney's copyright chokehold. On New Year's, Disney's copyright protection for an early version of the iconic character expired. Now anyone can use Mickey as he appears in the 1928 short film Steamboat Willie. Other characters entering the public domain include Peter Pan and Winnie the Pooh's Tigger. And take a look at this. Three mountain lion cubs were on the prowl in a California neighborhood. The man who shared the video and photos was on his lunch break when he spotted the fearless felines and reported it to the police. No word where the cubs' mother was. And that will be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk of America's News Now.
Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings and you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of The National Desk. I'm Didi Gatton and from all of us here, have a great week.